In this episode, I get to talk to Jay Papasan, the co-author of The One Thing, and this was done back in 2015, so I hope you enjoy. You've reached the Tony Mosey Podcast, interviewing the most influential people around the globe. He's a former psychology worker and military veteran turned tech professional and entrepreneur with the goal to educate and inspire you to fulfill your dreams. Whether that's transitioning into a new job, increasing skills, or turning your hobbies into a money-making gig, Tony shows that the world is big and opportunities are endless. And now, without further ado, the Tony Mosey Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I appreciate that you're such a, a huge fan of the book. And, you know, we want to write the books to, to create an impact. And just these little moments where it resonates back are pretty thrilling for us. So I would like to ask the simple yet profound question. Why is it important to focus on the one thing? Well, I think the reason we wrote it is at no other time in, in our, my lifetime, and certainly not Gary's, have we had so many opportunities, you know, to do new things and also in many ways, obligations. Um, a lot of us feel it every single day. Our to-do lists are, are really long. Our calendars are booked up and the ability to make great choices with our, our number one investment, which is our time. It's the only thing that doesn't get renewed, right? If we don't do it this year, there's no guarantee that a year gets added to the end of our lives that we'll get to do it later. You just may not get to do that thing. And so how we invest our time matters a lot. And so the one thing fundamentally is a resource for people to make better investments of their time and hopefully make those on a regular basis, you know, to do the things that matter most for their career, for their work, for their family, their health. And, you know, what the, the great byproduct of that, it means you're not doing all the other junk. And yeah. I have found it to be a huge relief in my re life to be able to just say no to things easier because I've said yes to things more meaningfully. So I, I, you know, I of course I definitely checked out a lot of your stuff, a lot of your other talks, and I don't want to ever get repetitive. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the the question I, I guess I want to I just want to magnify that idea because I think people have, and I've seen that this is a theme through without throughout your books and also your talks about the idea of focusing focus and if focus was a form of currency, if it was a form of currency, how many people would you think are poor? Oh gosh, we're we're impoverished right now. Um, I think our our focus meanders a lot. So it'd be kind of like high income people that spend all of their money and a little bit more, because um, we have all of these things calling for our attention and probably being called on to use it more than ever, you know, in the history of mankind. But it's also divided down between our cell phones and all the other things that are distracting us. So, yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. I think we've got a a poverty problem, but it's more like the millionaire next door. The people who you think are rich are often the poorest. You know, they've got all this stuff happening, but it's just flowing out between their fingers. It's true. So uh, what made you find, Jay, what made you find your one thing? You know, it took me a long time. You know, when I look at my entire life, um, two thirds of it, I think I was being drawn towards something that I couldn't have really articulated or I wasn't brave enough to articulate. Um, I've always wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't really pursuing it. I was just working in the book world. Um, the last 15 years, I've been a lot more purposeful. So I, I'm going to give the credit to my, my co-author, Gary Keller. I think that working with him crystallized for me how important it is to get clear about what it is you really want. Um, you know, when I used to teach this book, you know, it says the extraordinarily simple truth behind, you know, success and success is, is just getting what you want. And on its simplest level, you know, getting what you want means you're successful. It's not about having a million bucks because if you don't want that, that's not a success for you. But it is a problem for most people because if you really pin them down, they don't know what they want. There's still that challenge inherent. And I, I can tell you I was guilty um, for a lot of my life. I kind of knew what direction I wanted to go in but I didn't have a lot of clarity around it. And working elbow to elbow with that guy, you start to get clearer, you understand the importance of having a better vision for your life, and then working backwards to what you have to do. So, like I said, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone, but I think a lot of us don't have that clarity, and that clarity drives us forward. Yeah. 
uh, idea just popped up when you were talking about that with the clarity and also working with Gary on this. Uh, it, it sounds like the idea of collaboration definitely helped you find your one thing. And so uh, the, I'm thinking about philosophers out there where they, you know, Buddhist philosophers talking about you need to go inside, to figure out what, is, uh, you know, what you really want in life. But like, could you also stress that there is an importance to uh, having a team of people helping you to get to your successful peer, uh, point? If the question is not how I did it, but how would you advise someone to do it? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I okay. usually tell people um, you need some quiet time. A lot of times the answer is in front of us, but we don't stop and actually ask the question and give ourselves a little time for it to come into focus. So maybe take yourself to a cafe, um, get a glass of wine that's in the evening or a glass of tea in the morning, get out your journal and reflect upon the kinds of things and activities that have really brought you joy in your life. And it's not just about you know being happy, right? It's about fulfillment. And we write about that in the book. And so I think we often see clues there and then you can go to the people who know you best. Like, I love my spouse. Wendy knows me better than I know myself. And whenever I'm in doubt, I can ask her, you know, I think I'm kind of like this. Is that right? And she's like, no, you're fooling yourself. Or Absolutely. how could you not know that? And so your best friends, your spouse, um, you can say, hey, I think that why I'm here is for this. You know, that I really need to be helping people. Whatever that looks like, I need to be doing that they can bring a lot of validation and confirmation. And if you're completely lost, I've actually heard a lot, help me out with this. It's a little serious, it's a little heavy, which is why you go to your close friends, but they can say, dude, you were meant to write books. You don't see that? A lot of times people from the outside do see us better than we see ourselves. But I would start with yourself and then reflect it out so that you're not putting all the labor on them. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Let's see, jumping back and forth, but I, I liked what you said earlier, and it has me thinking too, even for myself. I like how you said in another chat that the common uh, misconception people have with your and Gary Keller's book is that people confuse the one thing with it being the only thing, yeah. and it's not... And it's not about the only thing. I like this concept of the one thing, but I feel people could bring up, uh, bring this up for a philosoph like a philosophical debate, such as myself. How can we redirect individuals into knowing their one thing? Well, I think this is a this is a case of it being a little bit of art, and you know, and more so than it being a science. But I do agree that in general, especially for the first two, you know, you use the words they help people, right? They educate people. And then obviously that's what coaching's about, right? And coaching tends to be a little bit more outcome oriented, getting results for people. Um, social media might be just something that you enjoy and also might be a necessary evil so that you can promote the first two services. So we talk about lining up your dominoes. Um, that's the main metaphor, like in the beginning of the book and it shows up again and again. But it's this idea that if you line up a bunch of dominoes, you can knock over one and get a bunch to fall down. Um, it doesn't mean they all fall down every time. But what we want people doing is it, at the very least, even if doing one doesn't make the other things happen automatically, it might make them easier. And it certainly means that they're aligned. Right. So I could see how all three of the activities you just listed are aligned. You know, the, the, in the social media, um, could be in part educational, but fundamentally that leads them to the, the deeper value proposition, which is where you probably also get paid, which is the coaching. And I can see you aligning those very easily and then justifying making regular investments of time and, 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 and making a battle around those three things happening on a regular basis. That's not too many things, by the way. Are you enjoying this episode? Please give a like, comment, follow, or subscribe. And now back to the Tony Mosey podcast. I remember you said in a talk that as a, as a child, you were trying to memorize all the trivial pursuit questions and answers. I mean, that's something that I would like to do. I mean, I, I feel like I want to take over the world, but I know that there's only so much time in my life that I can do all that. So like me trying to figure that out within the three things that I do is just definitely was very important to figuring well, that out. Well, we can both rule out the trivial pursuit, right? It might be nice to win the game, but it doesn't yeah. truly align with the others, right? To be a great interview, you, you don't have to know all the answers. You just have to ask good questions. Yeah. And so the same thing as being an author. Like, I mean, the truth is today, long, you know, this is way after the old trivial pursuits. Like, if you want the answer to something, Google it. 
right? So we yeah. don't have to know everything anymore. So, <laughs> but I, that's just reality. And sometimes it takes a coach or again, that, that spouse, that peer partner, that person who's willing to be honest with you um, to kind of reflect back. It's like, dude, you know, you said social media, but that doesn't mean every channel available. You know, like you look at uh, Seth Godin, He's one yeah. of the most successful social media people out there. How many channels can you find him on? Do you know? Uh, I mean, I know he's on podcasts. I know he's on YouTube. But in terms of how many channels on YouTube or podcasts, I can only guess on a handful. <laughs> well, I think he only made a stand around. He, he blogs. That's his main thing. I think he actually is the guy that's on his Twitter. And I think he leaves everything else for other people. Um, and it might be that he's now added YouTube, I'm not aware, but he was one of the first guys that's like, you don't have to be successful at Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Periscope. Pick what works best for you and be good at that. And that's yeah. kind of what I'm saying. Like social media is kind of a big bucket. So pick what works for you, what aligns with your dominoes. And then, you know, either be conscious yourself or hopefully there'll be people around you to kind of hold you accountable. It's like, okay, now you're just having fun and you're calling it work, but you're just having fun now. <laughs> and you know what, Jay? It, it's so true because you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the minds of the youth who are watching in this and they're primed with all the things they, especially if it's their most popular entrepreneur and they see that this guy's living or this woman is living a great life. They look at their Snapchat, their Instagram, their Twitter, and they see them going to basketball games and doing this and do that. Sometimes it gets to the point where you're wondering, what the hell does this person do? You know, what do they do? You know? And so, and of course, because these are like the these are like the leaders of, of our times right now. We follow, we, we emulate them. So I see some of these people that I look up to and I'm like, okay, is this what I got to do? Okay, I got to go out and go do this and I got to do that. And, and I think what you're saying is, is like it doesn't have to necessarily have to be that much, that outlandish of things, right? No, no. It's actually almost always fewer than you think. Mm -hmm. um, we can rationalize doing more because we enjoy them. Or we rationalize doing more because we're afraid that we'll be judged for not doing them. Um, it's just the reality of it. And I, I suffer from this as much as anyone, and which is why you know, we regularly come back to the book and, and, and try to minimize. We regularly come back to the principles in the book and ask, you know, Pareto's principle of the 10 things we're doing around this book launch, like what's really driving things? You know, I get, especially in the beginning, we experiment, right? Young people need to try new things to find out what they indeed like to do and they're good and talented at. And, mm -hmm. But then you need to come back and narrow so that you can give more energy to the handful of things that are really getting you the results that you want keeps you sane and by the way it can make you mad talented at those handful of things too if you do them long enough yeah. it, it wasn't it wasn't until after it wasn't until after undergrad where i found out the beauty of less is more when it came to writing because in high school we were taught to just fluff it up just add extra stuff and the more you could say and bs the the higher your grade at least that was the perception of many of us mm -hmm. and then i got to graduate school and then i had a professor who just massacred my paper but from that i learned and i go i went wow this is amazing this is what you i mean many people do not want to read endless fluff they want to get you to get right to the point you know yeah i mean i i've been there done that i mean i remember i had a writing professor at nyu which we were talking about before the yeah. the, the live stuff is uh I'm trying to think of his name now but we would study different authors and then instead of writing a paper about where you know um you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was was you know born and raised in his pivotal moments. We had to write um, four or five pages of a short story in that author's voice. So we had to imitate Faulkner. We had to imitate Hemingway. All those, and I can tell you, Faulkner, who's known for writing really long sentences and having lots of big words and long stuff, was much easier to imitate than Hemingway, who was incredibly spare. And that's where I kind of learned that lesson that. Um, there is beauty in the art of, of, of accomplishing something with less instead of just more. It actually is harder to do. It's harder for me, and that's why you do this thing, rhyming you know, poems, essentially. Yeah. I'd rather write a novel than a poem in some ways because you're being judged in chapters. When you, you boil it down to just a couple of lines of verse, every word, every sound actually matters. And so True. the stakes get a lot higher when you, when you bring things down. 
strong. Now, I'm not um, inside baseball. That's writer talk. So you brought that on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Game on. <laughs> All right. So uh, going back to the book, you're behind the scenes, actually – in terms of all the books, you're behind the scenes in other books. Um, I'd like to know, what other books have you helped put out together besides The Millionaire Investor or if just any any kind of way? Yeah, well, we've done about, I want to say, 12 books total, and not all of them have seen the public eye. Um, our first book was The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, which is a career guide for real estate professionals. That sold close to a million copies since 2003 when it came out. Then The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Um, then we partnered with some investors to create a book called Flip, which is obviously about flipping. Um, we've since gone back and written one called Hold, which is about buy and hold strategies. Um, we wrote a book called Shift um, that does bear our names. That was also a bestseller. And that was for real estate professionals operating in the really down market that we just came out of. And then some other obscure stuff. Like I worked with a guy on a book on Shift Commercial, which was how commercial agents should navigate that. My best buddy, uh, Ben Kenny and I wrote a book on social media that we gave away. It was called Social. Um, and it's still kind of relevant. I actually am being asked to speak on it next month. Um, and it just shows up every now and then. And we wrote it for free and won like a book award, but we never sold it. So there's like a bunch of little titles like that. Um, one other one that's really obscure um, was on uh, alternative financing for investment properties that we just kind of self-published. Okay. We've been and busy. We write about a book every year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> that is grinding it out right there. That's amazing. Um, so let's see. Yeah, somebody's going, what? Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of books. See, there's a lot of things that we don't know. <laughs> we see in the forefront on Amazon and other places. Okay, these are the things that are going on. But little do we know what goes on behind the scenes. You know, and that's amazing. Um, now, if, as far as the book, the one thing, I'm like, I see this book has gone global. I'm seeing it in, in, in a, a few different languages published. How many languages is the book currently published at? Uh, I think it's in, uh, been translated 26 times if you count British English. Um, we sold the rights to Great Britain and they changed a few words. But so 26 territories, 25 languages. Wow. Yeah, now, I love it. It's by far the I, most translated work that we've done. That is amazing. Wow, that's just amazing. And, and the fact that you went to school for France and you're working in publishing and writing, it had me wonder if you were one of the editors for the French version. Oh, no way. Um, I'll give that <laughs> to paid adults. Well, I mean, it's like it's one thing to be capable. It's another thing to be capable of doing it on a professional level. Um, I've seen what great translation looks like. I've seen what bad translation in English looks like, right? I mean, you've, you've been to a restaurant where the menu is barely intelligible. And you're like, boy, they could have used a professional. So, yeah, I'll leave that to the professionals. I'd like for the great French people to have the best possible opinion of our book. And that usually means that someone's going to be between us and them. Yeah. There was a talk. Um, you said that when it comes to writing a business book, it needs to be both enlightening and give the individual the ability to, to want to take action. Yeah. What was your yeah? Like what was your first uh, read that enlightened you and influenced you into taking action? You know, um, I think when Gary and I kind of arrived at, we were working together in the very beginning. This is back in the summer of 2002. And we were mapping out, like, what were our favorite books? And mm -hmm. what were the books that um, we felt were both instructive and they were insightful? And, like, Body for Life was a book I'd worked on. And it had changed kind of his paradigm and my paradigm about weight loss and exercise. So it had a, a paradigm change. But it also was very prescriptive. It told you what to do to get the results that you wanted. And we just kind of agreed that that's the kind of authors that we wanted to be. I'll tell you, a great book that doesn't fit that bill that we both cited is we both had loved, um, you know, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki because it's a big paradigm changing book. It changes the way you look at money. But I remember expressing to him, I said, but I got to the end of that book and I was very frustrated because I didn't know what to do. And he goes, exactly. And so I, it, it's a great book and it sells every year for a reason. But I carried a different expectation, I guess, than the average reader. I didn't want you just to change how I thought. I want to change the way I act. That's why I'm reading to begin with. And so we try to write books that fit both of those descriptions. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to like, comment, follow or subscribe. And for more information, be sure to check out the description. Thank you for tuning in and hope to see you again for the next episodes of the Tony Mosey Podcast.